To me, compost is one of the most amazing things in the world. What else can turn food waste like this, yes, even meat, dairy and citrus, I'll explain how later, into this. A totally natural, nutrient-rich soil additive that improves your soil structure, supports biodiversity and helps your plants hold on to the food and water they need to thrive. I've composted everywhere I've lived, even in a one bedroom apartment. In that time, I found three things to be key to creating great compost. When it comes to compost, size really does matter. The bigger your compost bin, or even better, compost pile, the quicker it will break down. At around one cubic metre and larger, compost hits critical mass and heats up with lots of microbial action. Not sure if you can see it on camera, but there's steam there which is a good sign. For my small yard, I find these 400 litre bins to be the perfect size. They're big enough to heat up, but don't take up too much room. I also love the design of these. The base is one single piece that's strong enough to use as a lever, and the snap fit lid keeps the heat and smells in and everything else out. The only thing I add is mesh on the bottom. When I upgraded from these smaller bins, I was amazed at the difference. The smaller ones just don't have the critical mass to heat up properly. The one time that bigger isn't best is when it comes to what's inside the bin. In this case, the smaller the material, the quicker it will break down. In bins like these, or compost piles, it's not worms that do most of the work, it's actually the microbes. Breaking everything into really small pieces allows them to access much more surface area and speeds up the process incredibly. Worms and other insects still play an important part, especially breaking down the cooler areas of your compost. Worms and microbes will naturally find their way into your compost, but if you want to really kickstart a new bin or pile, add a bucket or two of mature compost at the start. To speed up the process further, I use a Bakashi bin, then add this to my larger bins. Why do this hybrid system? I'll explain later, but for now, key number two. When the balance is out in your compost, it can just sit there seemingly doing nothing. Or worse, it can turn into a horrible stinky mess. That's why balance is my second key to great compost. Achieving perfect balance takes care, attention and a bit of discipline, but it's not actually that hard. And even if it all goes off the rails, a little help can have you back on track in no time. If you know anything about composting, you've probably heard about using material that is brown and green, or perhaps carbon and nitrogen. I don't find brown and green particularly useful terms because so much of what goes into my compost is neither brown nor green. This is all green, except for the eggshell, which is actually neither. Terms like carbon and nitrogen can also be hard to wrap your head around. Perhaps this is a better way to think of it. Nitrogen rich or green material is young, fresh, recently living and usually has a high water content. Food scraps, garden waste, lawn clippings and manure are all full of nitrogen as are freshly cut or mulched branches and leaves. On the other hand, carbon or brown materials are old dried out things like autumn leaves, paper, sawdust, wood shavings and cardboard. Note here, do avoid glossy prints or composite materials like envelopes with plastic windows or parcels with stickers. Speaking of stickers, I really wish these ones you get on fruit were compostable. The real secret to balance on this small property is collecting fallen leaves each autumn and keeping a stash of them on hand for whenever I need them. Four or five big bags each year usually gets me through. Why so many? In this garden, I'm always looking for extra carbon. Toilet rolls, egg cartons, shredded paper and thin cardboard are all kept to go into the compost, but it's just not enough for the amount of food waste that we produce. I find that adding leaves at a ratio of about four to one helps keep these bins in balance. I particularly like oak or pin oak leaves. They break down but not too quickly and provide plenty of aeration, especially if you stir them up as they go in. As much as I love leaves, a mix of materials is always best and a bit of trial and error is usually required until you find a balance that works best for you. Even then, it'll change slightly over the season, so be ready to mix it up as needed. And don't be upset if it takes a while to get the hang of it. As you can see, I'm regularly adding shredded paper into mine as well. I find shredded paper is really useful if the pile gets a little bit too damp as the paper quickly soaks up that moisture. How do you know if it's too wet? You can usually tell just by looking at it, but you can definitely tell by the smell. A well-balanced compost bin shouldn't smell bad. If it does, get some dry materials in there and give it a turn. If it's too dry, mix in some wet material and see if that doesn't fire it up. Once your bin or pile starts to fill up, you should start to see plenty of action. 
If not, get in there and give it a turn with a compost turner, a fork, or even better, a bit of both. This helps with aeration and keeps everything active and moving along. It can be heavy work, so activate your core and be careful you don't overdo it. Regardless of your composting system, duplication is essential. Be it worm farm, bakashi, hot or cold, eventually your pile or bin will fill up and it will need time to do its thing. So having a second one to move on to is a really good idea. Okay, okay, worm farms may be the exception here because they usually stack, but I still think you're better off with two. How long a compost bin like this will take to mature will depend on the balance inside and also the temperature outside. Here in Melbourne, in Australia, this one has taken about nine months. If your second bin fills up before your first one is ready, you can always take some out and bury it in your veggie patch. You could add some to a worm farm or just dig a hole and bury it that way. Just make sure it's deep enough down that nothing can dig it up afterwards. For a family of four on our small suburban block, a system of two 400 litre bins works really well. But as I mentioned earlier, I use a hybrid system that also incorporates two Bakashi bins. Bakashi allows us to compost all our food waste. Meat, bones, dairy, citrus, tea bags, you name it, it all goes in here. These scraps are inoculated with a spray or a bran like mixture and left to not exactly compost but it's more like ferment. Now I'm not going to say Bakashi doesn't smell because it does a bit and that's why it's outside but it's nothing like you'd expect considering what's inside. Sitting here I can hardly smell it even if I open it. It really doesn't smell bad at all. It takes about two weeks for us to fill up one of these bins which then sits and ferments and goes all kind of last of us inside. Like worm farms, Bakashi also creates a liquid that can be used as a fertilizer. Now this does smell a bit and it is pretty potent so make sure you dilute it heavily. And I'd caution against using it on any fruit or veggies that are close to harvesting or on your indoor plants. That is unless you're trying to get the kids out of the house. It is great for lawns, diluted to about one part to 20 and is also an amazing accelerator for compost piles at about one to one ratio. The only thing I tend not to put in the Bakashi here are coffee grounds. Not saying you can't, um, I just find that the grounds tend to block up the tap after a while. As for tea bags, no problem. As long as you avoid the ones containing plastic, you'll be fine. The only other thing I'd suggest is you probably don't want to add too many liquids because it can fill up a bit. So what if you don't have space for bins like these at your place? Worm farms can be a great option if you don't have too many scraps. I suggest sticking with finely chopped fruit and veg scraps with shredded paper and cardboard to balance it out. My worms also love eggshells, but citrus, meat and dairy are no-go zones. For composting those, you're best to use a Bakashi bin, another good solution for small spaces, although there is the ongoing cost of buying the activator I showed earlier. You could also try a partially buried bin. There are a few commercial ones available, but many people make their own by chopping the bottom off a lidded plastic bucket. Another option for a small yard is a tumbler. I do love the concept of these, but in practice, I've never managed to make them work for me. Failing that, you might want to team up with a neighbor to get a compost bin for a communal area or donate your scraps to a community garden or a composting service. This is by no means a full list, but hopefully it will give you an idea of how you might be able to start your composting journey. As you've probably noticed, there is a special place in my heart for compost, so I hope this inspires you and you start composting too. I'll definitely do more videos on compost in the future, so let me know in the comments if there's anything in particular you'd like me to focus on, but until then, grow well. <laughs> That'd be some water birds. <laughs>